The day before yesterday, we went through all of the different types of EMR, and you still need to know about all of that. But focusing on yesterday, the idea that light is some form of energy, which it is, and we now know there are these other forms of energy, like infrared radiation, ultraviolet radiation, microwave radiation, X-ray radiation, gamma ray radiation, all of these things are types of energy. A curious scientist would ask the question, how is the energy moving from one place to another? Is it moving from one place to the other because the energy is a bunch of little lumps of energy, a bunch of little particles of energy streaming through space? Because if it is, then this would be how we could visualize what a beam of light is. We don't see the little tiny pieces because there's so many of them and they're moving really fast. <laughs> they're moving at the speed of light. Uh, but there's so many of them that we don't see the individual pieces. Uh, or is it, in fact, the case that light is some kind of a wave energy, like a jello wave or a water wave or a sound wave, where there's something that's oscillating, and as a result, the energy moves in the direction perpendicular to the oscillation? Classically speaking, if you go back to early science in terms of, I don't really want to say modern science, I wouldn't call it modern, but when science started to take a foothold in the world, when there were scientists and experiments, uh, Isaac Newton supported the particle model of light because he knew there was nothing between the sun and the earth that could be vibrating to transmit the light from the sun to the earth. And that is true. There is nothing between the sun and the earth. It's a vacuum. So that's Newton's criticism of the wave model of light. Young's criticism of the particle model of light is that light actually does do something that only waves do, which is to interfere. So briefly here, I think this will be worthy of a brief explanation because when we get to interference, we'll need to talk about it. If I have a rope and I shake the rope so that I get a crest of the rope traveling in that direction, you can just imagine that I have a slinky or something and I give it a quick shake back and forth and I get this ripple traveling through. But at the other end of the rope, you do the same thing and these two things travel towards each other. They will actually, I'm going to change this slightly, they will actually add up when they meet to give you wave energy with a greater amplitude. This is what we call interference. And those two pulses, this wave pulse and this wave pulse on the right and the left, at the instant in time that I've drawn in black, those two wave pulses are in the same place at the same time. Those two forms of energy exist in the same place at the same time. And even stranger is the fact that if you take a look at this a short time later, the green one will continue on its way and the other one will continue on its way. They actually pass through each other. And I think if you were in my Physics 20 class, I showed you a video of this in action and it's kind of bizarre. Particles cannot pass through each other, right? So when Thomas Young does an experiment that shows light can interfere, and we'll study that in detail, he looks over to Newton and says there's no way light could be a particle because particles can't interfere. And they both have valid points, which is why we have to say light is kind of a wave at times and a particle at times. In the end, though, we have this modern wave model developed by James Clerk Maxwell. Um, which says that light is a wave, which says that light is a wave, but the waves are not material waves. They're not mechanical waves, which you study in Physics 20. They're called electromagnetic waves, and what's waving are fields. There's an electric field and a magnetic field that are mutually creating each other, and they're always moving in a direction that's perpendicular to the field 
that's electric and also that electric field is perpendicular to the field that's magnetic and it travels through space. So where does that leave us? In terms of yesterday's work, it leaves us with the fact that, I'm not sure what happened here. It leaves us with the fact that since light is a wave, we can apply the universal wave equation on the left and we can also apply the relationship connecting period and frequency. And since light travels at a constant speed, we can apply our motion formula for velocity, speed equals distance over time. And that's where we ended up yesterday. So you had a number of questions. Oh, I meant to put that up earlier. You need, you're going to need your textbooks today for the first time this semester so far. You're going to actually need it. Everybody's looking around to see if they have it. Um, does anybody have any questions from the practice problems that were listed? No? Are you sure? All right, so what we are going to do today is investigate the speed of light. Not actually do an experiment, but we're going to talk historically about determining the speed of light. We don't have any kind of equipment here in a high school physics lab that we could use to determine the speed of light. But certainly if you take physics in university, the potential exists for you doing at least one of these experiments we're going to talk about. Albert Education says it's just as important for you to be able to calculate the speed of light from an experimental data set. It's just as important for you to do the calculations as for you to be able to evaluate the effectiveness of the experiment, to evaluate how good the experiment would be at determining the speed of light. Okay, whether it's a good experimental design or whether it's a bad experimental design, you need to be able to tell me and the diploma exam, which it is. So very early efforts to determine the speed of light are not generally considered successful. Think about determining the speed of an object. A baseball goes flying by. And then you throw the baseball again, and you throw the baseball again, and you consistently throw it at the same speed. How is it you determine the speed of that baseball? Well, unless you have some kind of a radar gun that you can point at the baseball, and we have one here, uh, you have to measure distance and you have to measure time. That's how you're going to determine speed. So I suppose what you could do if the baseball is flying through space is um, you could have somebody facing where the baseball leaves the hand, maybe where Tyson is, and where Shesmida is, where we're going to end our measurements, and we would measure that distance. We'd put down a tape measure or meter sticks from Tyson to Shesmida, and we would have the distance. And then what you would have is maybe Tyson yelling, go, when the baseball passes him, and Shesmida yelling, stop, when it passes her, and a third person has got a stopwatch where they're using their phone. And then you measure the distance and the time. Clearly, there's a problem here because light is traveling really fast. We know this. You have in your mind more scientific knowledge than Galileo ever did or Newton ever did. You do. You're taught things in grade two and three that they had no clue about. So we already know that the speed of light is very fast. In fact, the ancient Greeks, when they philosophized about light, they thought it was infinitely fast, which is a very bizarre notion. That what that would mean is that if a light bulb went on someplace in the universe, that that light would instantly appear everywhere else in the universe at the same time, which is really kind of a shabby way of thinking, that something could be moving infinitely fast. Um, common sense says, well, that kind of would make sense, but we know it's incorrect. Galileo was the first person, at least in recorded history, to make a serious attempt at determining the speed of light. And this is his idea, and I'm just going to explain it to you in my own words. You could read this at your own pace later. What he did is we, he found two hills. Sometimes it says they're mountaintops, but if you look historically at where he did this experiment in Europe, they were big hills, tiny mountains. And he stood on top of one hill, and he had an assistant stand on top of the other. And they both had lanterns. Uh, there weren't electric batteries or any kind of 
technology like that back then. So what they had was a lantern which had a flame in it. And in order to turn the lantern on and off, there was a leather cover. So you would cover the lantern off, or cover the lantern with the cover. And somebody looking from far away would see that the light is off. And if you uncovered the lantern, you would be effectively turning the lantern on. So this is Galileo's idea. His assistant is on the other hill. Galileo is going to uncover his lantern and start timing. Going to start timing somehow. I'll talk about that in a second. The light is going to leave his lantern and spread out through space. And when the light hits the assistant, and the assistant will know the light has hit them when they see the light, the ins assistant is instructed to turn their lantern on to pull the hood off of their lantern. And then that light is going to travel back towards Galileo. And Galileo is going to stop timing. So what Galileo is effectively doing is trying to measure the time between when the light leaves his lantern, hits the assistant, and comes back. I'm not sure why he didn't just put a mirror over there, because they did have mirrors, but that would be the principle that the light is going to travel from Galileo to the assistant, and then from the assistant to Galileo, and Galileo is going to attempt to measure this time. He attempted to measure the time by using his pulse as a tool. <laughs> and right away, a lot of you are starting to see the problem with this. So, uh, first of all, a person's pulse is very variable, but let's assume that you were absolutely level in your physiology and your pulse was always one beat per second, which would be weird. That would mean he would start timing when he unveiled his lantern and he would start counting pulses. There's some historical documents that suggest he went a little bit further than that. I don't know if this is true or not, and he used a water clock. And what a water clock is, is it's a very ingenious idea. It's a basically a container that's filled with water and there's a hole in the container um, that you can open and close and there's water in here and then you also have a reservoir to collect the water so when the water drains out of this it pours into this reservoir. And forgetting about his experiment, this is kind of an interesting idea, a water clock. Basically what you could do is you could unplug this thing and let it drain for an hour. And you might say, well, how would they know it's been draining for an hour? You watch the sun. You use a sundial. They did have clocks. Or you use some kind of measuring device for time. And then after an hour, you would see how much water is in here. And basically then, if you knew how much water came out in an hour, then you could take any amount of water that came out and convert it to a time. Okay. Anyway, the two hills are maybe, I don't know, let's say a kilometer apart, 1,000 meters. That means the light is traveling a distance of 1,000 meters there and 1,000 meters back. Just for kicks, let's find the time it takes light to travel 2,000 meters. We, kn we know how to do this. Galileo didn't, because he didn't know the speed of light. So 2,000 meters divided by 3 multiplied by 10 to the 8 meters per second gives, by my count, 6.6 .6 repeating times 10 to the, I want to say, negative 4, 5, 6, Six seconds. Six point seven milliseconds. Now, I don't care whether he's using a water clock or his pulse, he cannot measure that time. And there's a real significant reason why he can't. And what I will say to you is even if he had over here an infinitely accurate stopwatch that was capable of measuring that small amount of time, the experiment was still doomed to fail. 
Why is that? This is this is where we're. At. Could such an attempt be successful, even assuming he could measure that tiny amount of time, which he couldn't? That's one issue. What's the other issue? Reaction time. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I could play, and have played, tens of thousands of hours of video games, and it doesn't matter. When that monster jumps out when I'm playing Doom, I still don't react right away. I mean, I react in my brain, but it takes half a second for me to hit the control to do something about that monster coming out at me. All right? And the fact of the matter is, there's a delay, we call it reaction time, between the time your senses pick up something and your body can physically move to react. Good afternoon. No, no problem. Certainly. That's okay with you? Okay. So you you can't I can try, I can practice playing Doom forever, and I just can't get over that. That's why um, if I'm behind somebody on the highway and I see they're very close to the vehicle in front of them, I don't want to be behind that person. Because if something happens, a moose runs out and hits the first vehicle, it doesn't matter how good of a driver the other person thinks they are, they cannot physically hit the brake in time. So what we're going to do is determine what a person's reaction time is. Who's feeling really good here about this? You want to give it a shot? OK, so here's what's going to happen. Sienna's going to put out her hand like this. You can just stay there. That's OK. She's going to put out her hand like this. Uh, just put it down a little bit lower. Good. So I'm going to let go of this, and then she's going to grab it. So she can see when I release it, she's going to grab it. Now, if she, Sienna had no reaction time, then when I let go and she grabbed it, go ahead and grab it. It would look like that, right? You can let go. But that doesn't work that way. Oh, that's not very good. I, oh, okay. Ready? That's pretty good. Um, about 34 centimeters is how far this fell in the time you could react. And let, let's even say 30, because maybe you want to practice and practice and practice, and Galileo's going to practice and practice and practice. He's got to react to the light coming back to him, and the assistant has to react to the light hitting them. So there's two reaction times. Let's say 30 centimeters. That fell 0 0.30 meters. And the vertical distance it falls is 1 half a t squared. And we know the acceleration due to gravity is 9.81. So when we calculate the time it takes that meter stick to fall 0.3 meters, what we're finding in this trial is Sienna's reaction time. And I would like you to do that. I would like you to take 0.3, set it equal to 1 half a t squared, and solve for t. Don't forget to take the square root. And by my count, you get about a quarter of a second, which is pretty good. That's really pretty good. Normally, it's around 0.4 of a second. Um, and again, if you're driving in a vehicle, a quarter of a second when you're traveling very, very fast, that you can travel a big distance, right? And when I'm playing my video game in a quarter of a second, that monster can consume me before I have a chance to react. Um, so here's the bigger problem. Galileo's trying to measure something that's a little tiny sliver of his reaction time. All he is going to be measuring in this experiment is reaction time. He's using a device that's like a shovel to measure out an eighth of a teaspoon. It's just not going to work. So the reaction time here is too great. When I say it's too great, and I don't think we need to write a novel in answering this. When I say it's too great, all we mean, or all I mean, is the reaction time is actually bigger than what it is you're trying to measure the time of. 
So you're not going to be able to use that tool successfully. I mean, just the experiment wouldn't work. And you can even see that, that there's a delay here. I know this is just a cartoon. I know it's not a real video. But there's a delay between the flash on Galileo's lantern and the flash over here, not because it takes that long for the light to travel from Galileo to the assistant, but it takes that long for the assistant to react. Does that make sense? OK. Uh, the next method used to determine the speed of light is one that it wasn't an actual experiment that was designed to do this. It was an accidental kind of experiment uh, that involved astronomical data collected by an astronomer by the name of Romer. And Christian Huygens, who was a physicist, explained what was going on. So around 1865, uh, Romer was using Newton's laws of motion and gravity, which were very well understood and valid, to predict when eclipses around the planet of Saturn, I think, oh, Jupiter, uh, uh, when eclipses of the moons of Jupiter occurred. So what this means is when you look through a telescope, and you don't need a really expensive telescope to see this, and you locate Jupiter, you will see these dots around kind of the equator of Jupiter, and they're moving. And what they are are the moons of Jupiter moving between Jupiter and your telescope. And you can use Newton's laws of motion to predict when that's going to happen. And what Romer discovered is about half of the time, the calculations gave a very precise prediction. I'm going to jazz up the explanation here a bit just to have it make sense. You know, you'd look at his watch and go, oh, there's going to be a, an eclipse of one of the moons of Jupiter in two minutes. He went out, pointed his telescope at that location in space, and saw it. It was there. It happened when it was supposed to happen. But sometimes it was late by 22 minutes. And as the year went by, the delay between when Newton's laws said the eclipse would happen and when it actually happened, that delay increased from zero up to 22 minutes, and then it started going back down to zero. And then it increased to 22 minutes, back down to zero. So why do you think that is? It's a very, it's a complicated thing. Liam. Right. So what a lot of people, what Liam just said is Jupiter is getting further and further from Earth. What a lot of people would say is, well, it takes time for light to go from Jupiter to the Earth. And that's true, but it takes time for light to go from Jupiter to the Earth no matter what. But what happens is at different times of the year, the distance between the planets gets bigger or smaller depending on the location of the orbit. Let me show this to you. You should know from Physics 20 that since Jupiter is quite far away from the sun, the gravitational force on it is relatively weak, and it moves pretty slow in its orbit. And what that means is that a year on Jupiter, the time it takes Jupiter to go around the sun once, is going to be considerably longer than the time it takes for Earth to go around the sun once. So here's where the Earth is at some point in time. The yellow dot is the sun. The brown dot is Jupiter. Six months later, and there's the light path from Jupiter to the Earth. Six months later, Earth is going to be on the opposite side of its orbit. And Jupiter will have moved on its, it, in its orbit, but it will not have moved very far. And essentially, if you compare these two distances, the brighter distance that you're looking at is longer by the diameter of the Earth's orbit. It takes time for the light to travel this distance. And it takes time for the light to travel this distance. But that distance is an extra distance equal to the diameter of the Earth's orbit, which means that that 22-minute delay corresponds to light traveling 
across the diameter of the Earth's orbit? That's the answer to this question. And I have seen this on a diploma exam before. It's a specific thing that you need to understand. So the 22 minute delay was a result of the time it takes the light from Jupiter's moon to travel across the Earth's orbit. Discrepancy means error. So at that time, astronomers believed the diameter or the radius of the Earth's orbit to be about 1.49 times 10 to the 11 meters. Hugens looked at this astronomical data. I don't know if they had a relationship or not, or they, you know, Romer went to Hugens and said, hey, Hugens, can you help me out here? What's going on? But at some point in history, Hugens figured this out, and what he did was he took the diameter of the Earth's orbit, and divided by that 22-minute delay to get an experimental value of the speed of light. Um, we need to take two times this number given in the question because that number 1.49 times 10 to the 11 is meters. That's a radius. And it's got to be the diameter of the Earth's orbit. We also need to divide by the number of seconds. Is my math right that it would be 1,320 seconds? It is. So 22 times 60, which is 1,300 and 20 seconds and we get a number that I believe I seem to recall I don't know why 2.25 times 10 to the 8 very close or not is it 2.25 or 2.26 2.26 so it's 2.26 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And you know what, everybody? That's not too shabby. Right? That's pretty good. It's not like they got 5 meters per second or 8 times 10 to the 12 meters per second. It's in the right neighborhood. They don't know what the theoretical value of the speed of light is. We do. You don't have to write this down, but if I take that experimental value and subtract the theoretical value, the number on our formula sheet, and then divide by the theoretical value and multiply by 100, I'm finding a percent error. We get about negative 25 percent error. And I know in chemistry, do you do percent error in chemistry? You put absolute value signs around the whole thing? We don't do that in physics. Because this negative tells us something. It tells us that they were 25% too low. But that's pretty good. All right, now we're going to move on to a more modern approach. And this is an experiment I actually did in university, a variation of it. But any questions with this method of determining the speed of light? All right, so the Michelson rotating mirror speed of light experiment is a very specific experiment that you need to know how to analyze the data of. And what Michelson has is a rotating octagonal mirror. The size of this thing, you could hold this mirror in the palm of your hand. It's very tiny. It's about three or four centimeters across in his original experiment. And it spins. It's just spinning like crazy. And he, a large distance away, he has another mirror, which is serving a purpose that's going to reflect light between that rotating mirror and that curved mirror. Uh, don't worry about why it's curved. It is. The distance is very large. 
between these two mirrors. It's 35 kilometers in his original experiment. So he's got part of this lab set up on the top of one mountain and 35 kilometers away on top of another mountain, he's got the other part of it set up. Um, this curved mirror is just fixed to the top of Mount Antonio. And what Michelson does is sits in a lab 35 kilometers away. Imagine, I'm going to explain this in my own words rather than walking you through what I've typed out. You can read that later if you like. Imagine that this mirror is not rotating. If this mirror is not rotating and we have a light source here, by the way, this light source could be a candle, it could be a laser, it could be whatever you want, and it's literally less than a foot away from Michelson who's sitting in a chair looking through a telescope at this mirror. All right. So Michelson's sitting here, the rotating mirror is here on a, on a lab bench, on the other side is a light source. And probably the light source is set up so that it's not glowing in the room. It's behind a screen with a little hole in it, so you get a fine beam of light coming out of that light source through the opening in the screen. And it hits that octagonal mirror. It travels 35 kilometers to the curved mirror. It reflects off of that and travels 35 kilometers back to the octagonal mirror, where it then reflects into Michelson's eye. Why does he need a telescope? Because even though that light source is less than a foot away, he's looking at it from a distance of over 70 kilometers. He's, he's looking at light that's on a 70 kilometer journey, 70,000 meters. And as the light hits the mirror and travels through the air, it's going to get dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. I'm sure you're aware of this, that if you have headlights in fog, the headlights light up the air very well right in front of the vehicle, but they light up stuff less and less the further you go. Okay, it gets dissipated. So we need the telescope to see it. Now, if the mirror is not rotating, the only way Michelson can see that light source is if the rotating mirror is in that position drawn right now. Right? If and it's not rotating, let's pretend it's not rotating, if that rotating mirror is like that, he will not see the light source. Because what's going to happen is this beam of light is going to hit, it's going to reflect, it might hit this mirror but I don't even know which way it would reflect now. It would reflect maybe in about that direction. It misses the target. It misses the mark. So in order for Michelson to see the light source, when the light <clears throat> reflects off of the rotating mirror, either when it hits the rotating mirror the first time or when it hits it the second time, the mirror that's rotating has to be in that fixed position. So now let's imagine it's spinning. If it's spinning, this is tricky, if it's spinning and he's looking in the telescope and he doesn't see the light, what that means is either when the light first hit the mirror at point X or when it hit the mirror for the second time at point Y, the mirror wasn't in that exact position. So. In order for him to see it, the mirror has to be in this position when the light first hits it, and it has to be in that position when the light second hits it. I know my English there was a little tortured, but when it, the light hits it for the second time, it has to be there. And that means this. If you can see the light, then the time it takes the light to go from here back to here has to correspond to that rotating mirror turning either an eighth of a revolution or two eighths of a revolution or three eighths of a revolution in the time between when the light first strikes the mirror and then strikes it again. This has to rotate exactly one eighth, two eighths, three eighths, four eighths, etc. of a revolution. Does that make sense? 
If it rotates 1.78 eighths, then it won't be in that ideal position. So now what he does is he slows the rotation down. He looks through the telescope. He gets this thing spinning really fast. And he looks through the telescope and says to himself, I can't see anything. So I'm going to slow the rate of rotation down. And at some rate of rotation, he sees the light. And he records the rate at which it's spinning at that point. And then he continues to look, and he slows the rotation down even more until he sees another point when he sees the light. And he continues to do this until he slows it down all the way and doesn't see a final beam of light. And what this means, everybody, is that last data where he could see the light meant the mirror rotated an eighth of a rev. So how I put this in your notes, I want to read this to you, is He adjusted the rate of rotation so that the rotating mirror was moving as slow as possible, yet could still see the light. If it's moving as slow as possible, that means it has rotated an eighth of a revolution. And if you know the distance traveled by the light, which is 70,000 kilometers, and you know how long it takes the mirror to rotate an eighth of a revolution, then you can calculate the speed of light. So that's the qualitative aspect of his experiment. Any questions about the experiment itself? We're going to do some calculations here. but So number two says the set of rotating mirrors in Michelson's experiment was rotating at 533 hertz, and the curved mirror is 35 kilometers away. This is your question. Okay. What's the speed of light? So the frequency of rotation of this little tiny octagonal mirror is 533 times per second. Like, you don't want to touch it. Right? You hurt your finger. It's really, really flying. This is why it's so small. If it were big and you spun it that fast, the forces involved would just tear it apart. It's just this little tiny thing. And we want to use this formula to calculate the speed of light. Well, we know the distance traveled by the light is 70,000 meters. It's there and back. What the time has to be, so this is there and back, what the time has to be is the time for an eighth of a revolution. So somehow we have to go from knowing the frequency, which is how many revolutions per second, and get a time for an eighth of a revolution. And I've thought of different ways to teach this over the years. And the best way, it always comes down to this, is to use a formula for period. This is not the period of a light wave. This is just the period of revolution of the rotating mirror. And it's capital T. So if we take capital T as being 1 over F, we're going to have 1 over 533 hertz, which, as I mentioned yesterday, is per second. We're going to get seconds. So you get 1.876 times 10 to the negative 3 seconds. And that's the period of revolution of the rotating mirror. That's how long it takes the mirror to go around once. Once. Now, I used to teach this next part by using ratios, but I think it's just that can be confusing. Notice that this T we found is capital T. It's big T. The T we're going to use in the formula is little t. We have to do something to that big T to make it smaller. And the answer is we have to divide it by 8. 
Because if that big T is the time for one revolution, then when we divide it by eight, that will be the time for an eighth of a revolution. And then we can answer the question by taking the distance divided by the time. So I'm getting 2.345 times 10 to the negative 4 seconds. The distance is the distance there and back, which is 70,000 meters, divided by that time, which gives me 2.98 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, which is a very accurate result. This experiment was first done in the early 1900s, so about 120 years ago, roughly. Uh, very, very close to being the value that it should be. When I did this exper experiment in university, um, so at the U of A, we didn't have mountains that we could that were 35 kilometers apart. I don't know what they do now. You, you could potentially you know, use towers in Edmonton to perform this experiment. We did it in one room, but there was a series of lasers that were bounced back and forth across hundreds of mirrors. So we go back and forth and back and forth. The idea behind using 35 kilometers or many reflections is that then your distance gets big enough that the time is measurable, right? If you're trying to measure the time it takes light to travel from one side of this room to the other side of the room, you've got a real problem because it's going to be a very tiny time. All right, let's take a look at number three. I'm assuming, because I think I know what I did when I edited this, I'm assuming this is your number three. And that means I deleted number four. I did, so we'll deal with that when I get to it. In question two, you were determining in this formula, speed equals distance over time. In question two, you were finding the speed, the experimental speed. In question three, we want to find d. So we know the speed of light. The speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. We want to find d, which means we need to put in here the time for an eighth of a revolution. I'm just going to erase this t because we're going to put a number in here right away. Well, in example two, we had a frequency of revolution and it was given in hertz. Correct? Did it say hertz? This says RPS, which is really just trying to mess with you a little bit in the head. That's revolutions per second, but that's hertz. It still hurts. So from the frequency of 560 hertz, you can find the period in seconds, and you can find the time for an eighth of a revolution in seconds. The reciprocal of the frequency is the period. Then you can divide that by 8 to get the time for an eighth of a revolution. So the period works out to be 0 0.00179 seconds. When I divide that by 8 to get the time for an eighth of a revolution, I get 2.232 times 10 to the negative 4 seconds. Which I can then put over here.
and cross multiply to get the distance. So if I multiply that time by the speed of light, There we go. I get 6.7 times 10 to the 4 meters. And that's wrong. It's not the right answer. Why not? Farhan? Right. This distance we found is there and back. The question isn't how far is it there and back. The question is how far is it between the two mirrors. So just like in example two where we took that distance of 35 kilometers and we had to double it to get D in the formula, when the formula spits out 6.7 times 10 to the 4, that's there and back. We have to divide it by 2. So the actual distance between the mirrors would be that 6.695 or whatever it is, 6.70 times 10 to the 4 divided by 2. It's actually 33.5. 3.5. Times 10 to the 4 meters. Are we okay with example 3? All right. Let's take a look at example 4 now. Example 4 says that the rotating and fixed mirrors are, does that say 45 kilometers apart? So in this particular question, in the first one, number two, we were finding the speed in this formula. In the second one, we were finding D in this formula. In this question, this is number four in your notes. We need to find T so that we can determine the frequency. There's another significant difference in number four. It's a 10-sided mirror, which means that in this formula, this, of course, is there and back. But this will be the time for a tenth of a revolution. The reason why we go with a tenth is when you look at the question, it's asking you for the minimum frequency, which corresponds to the least amount of rotation. Well, we can put in the speed of light. <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> I can put in the speed of light. 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. We can put in the distance of 90,000 meters. I think that's right. 45 kilometers times 2 is 90 kilometers. And there's 1,000 meters in a kilometer. Over the time, oh, this is easy. I can do this one. T is going to be equal to 3 times 10, watch, I'll get it wrong, to the negative 4 seconds, I think. Is that right? It is. Now, we want the frequency. And in order for you to determine the frequency, you need to take the reciprocal of the period. But again, there's that visual cue that the period is capital T. This is lowercase t. So we're going from a small t, it's just a way to remember what to do, to a big t. We are going to have to multiply this by 10. Why 10? Because it's a 10-sided mirror. And if it takes 3 times 10 to the negative 4 seconds to go 1 tenth of a way around, then to go all the way around, we've got to multiply by 10 because there's 10 tenths in a full rev. This is 3 times 10 to the negative 3. Am I right? 
So then the frequency will be 1 divided by 3 times 10 to the negative 3 seconds. I want to say that's 333 hertz. Sorry for my jumbling of the examples there and renumbering them. So the expectation is that you can solve a problem dealing with Michelson's rotating mirror experiment by either calculating the speed of light from the frequency and the distance, finding the distance from the frequency and the speed of light, or finding the frequency from the speed of light and the distance. I think I got them all. Any questions with that final example? All right, so you have some questions in the textbook to do. Do these match the problems I listed in your handout? You should, yeah. So you'll need your textbook. Many of you have your textbooks at the class of the room, but the class of the room, the back of the room. Uh, some of you need to get them from your locker, and that's fine too. Okay.